talk. So we're certainly uh, very pleased to, to welcome Shorab uh, for his talk from Stanford University. Shorab Chatterjee will address us on um, a probabilistic mechanism for quark confinement. So if you want to take it away, Shorab, please. Okay, thanks, Alan. Uh, and, you know, thanks to the organizers for organizing, you know, uh, this whole new paradigm in online conferences. Uh, so I, I know nothing about organizing such conferences. It's even scary to think about it. But anyway, uh, thanks to the organizers for successfully putting this together. Um, so, um, uh, okay. So uh, let me uh, let me start with um, um, okay. So let me start with um, non-technical. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll introduce notation and everything later on. Just let me begin with uh, sort of non-technical um, uh, um, story about this. Um, so, what are uh, quantum Yang-Mills theories? So, these are components of the standard model of quantum mechanics. Um, so, this is uh, the uh, our best-known model for the the microscopic world, and it's a huge um, thing. And, um, but the, there is one um, aspect of it, which is uh, uh, not satisfactory, which is that it's, uh, there is no rigorous mathematical construction of these, uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this quantum gauge theories, or at least the ones that uh, are relevant from a physical point of view. Um, so, uh, so to solve the mathematical problem, uh, the most popular approach is the program of constructive field theory and what people do in this approach is that one starts with a statistical physics model on the lattice, okay? And then, uh, so that's an entirely probabilistic object, and then one tries to pass to a continuum limit of um, this uh, statistical physics model on the lattice. And the third step is to show that this continuum limit, if it can be constructed, satisfies some axioms. Uh, so there are these axioms of constructive field theory, various sets of axioms. And if one can show that these actions are satisfied, then there is a standard machinery which allows the construction of the quantum field theory. Okay. So, so that's the, the constructive field theory approach. So the quantum field theory itself is not a statistical physics model. It's not a probabilistic object. It's more like construction. Uh, so quantum field theory traditionally is, the, the, is an operator value distribution. So it's, uh, uh, it's more about constructing operators on Hilbert spaces. Uh, but one can start from the statistical physics thing and then convert it into this kind of thing. So this, taking this program to its completion is one of the uh, clay problems, as uh, most of you know. Um, so the statistical mechanical models that are considered in the first step of this program uh, for qu quantum Yang-Mills theories are known as lattice gauge theories. Okay? Uh, and these are also probabilistic objects, although they are not uh, as... Uh, uh, well studied as the, let's say the Ising model or things like that. But uh, so these are, these are also entirely well-defined things. Lattice, these are lattice gauge theories. And there are various levels of complexity. So one can um, uh, you know, couple a lattice gauge theory with the Higgs field uh, and, uh, or, or you may not, and you just consider pure lattice gauge theory, which, are, which is a simpler object. Uh, so in this talk, we'll do only deal with pure lattice gauge theories. Uh, so a pure lattice gauge theory has uh, various components. Uh, one is what's called a gauge group. So this is a, a compact uh, matrix Lie group. So this is a physics terminology. So I mean, mathematicians mean something else by the gauge group, but uh, it's, it's just a group associated with a theory, which is a compact uh, matrix uh, Lie group usually. And the dimension of space time. So usually the most important case is dimension four because our space time is four dimensional. And there's a parameter known as a coupling strength. And these theories on their own, even if you don't want to pass to a continuum limit or construct a quantum theory, can yield substantially relevant, uh, physically relevant information. So, so the thing is, you know, the point of interest here is that there are many things in physics. Uh, so, the, so, the, so theoretical physics around quantum field theory is mainly about perturbative calculations. So, so you, uh, you know, this whole machinery of Feynman diagrams is you start with something which is Gaussian and then you add a non-Gaussian component to it. Uh, with a small parameter in front, and then you expand, and then you uh, do these perturbative calculations, and they can be very, very complex, uh, and you do that. But there are many things which are beyond perturbation theory. So it is believed that you, know, you cannot really get a hold of them with perturbation theory, because you really have to understand the full expansion to get a hold of these things. 
And the only way to study these things are using lattice gauge theories and using numerical simulations as of now, uh, because uh, you, know, you cannot deal with them theoretically. So there are, there are you know, a huge amount of computational effort that is spent, you know, huge you know, running supercomputers even running, there, there are people doing this in CERN, uh, to you know, predict masses of elementary particles and other quantities using lattice gauge theories. So, uh, so you know, there are all kinds of elementary particles and you know, most of, of which you, know, you wouldn't uh, even know if you're not a physicist. Uh, and uh, you can use lattice gauge theories, uh, you know, not pure lattice gauge theories, more co complicated versions um, uh, to simulate and, uh, you know, predict the masses of these things. And uh, so I've been told that um, in many cases, the predictions match up to 1% accuracy. So, which is, which is pretty good. So now coming to the mathematical questions, uh, there are two very important questions which are already mentioned in the, in the clay problem um, uh, description. Uh, one is the mass gap. So uh, this is the question of Yang Mills mass gap. And in lattice gauge theories, there is lattice gauge version of mass gap, which is you know, proving that would uh, you know, almost be like solving the problem. Uh, so that's, that's the main step to prove this exponential leak of correlations under a certain kind of boundary condition. And so this uh, thing, this um, certain kind, kind of boundary condition, it's, it's a rather subtle point and it's not usually uh, mentioned, but you know, I ran into this and so I, I'll tell you what, what this is about. Uh, so, so this is equivalent to exponential degree of correlations. And it's not hard to establish if you, uh, it, under a strong coupling, so there is this coupling strength. So if it's large, then it's not hard to establish. Um, so that's like the high temperature phase of statistical physics models uh, where you know, exponential decay is not hard to prove. But the theories are physical relevant only at weak coupling. So, so it's believed that many theories, uh, many of these uh, lattice gauge theories in four dimension uh, have exponential decay in all regimes. So there is no phase transition. So that's what is believed. Um, but we don't know how to prove that. 4D or even 3D, 3D may be easier. We don't know how to prove um, exponential decay at weak coupling, which means at low temperature in statistical physics terminology. Okay. And there are, but, but there are huge Monte Carlo studies, uh, which show beyond doubt that this conjecture is correct and also give correct physical prediction. So these exponents, so in this exponential degree of correlation, these exponents that you get, these um, are associated with the masses of particles. So that's, um, that's what they want to predict. So that's one thing. And the other big question is a problem of quark confinement. And this is also mentioned in the clay problem uh, description. Um, so, so quarks are um, constituents of various elementary particles such as protons and neutrons. And you know, it's just a cartoon picture that I'll describe. I mean, the actual thing is more complicated. So you, know, you have these protons and neutrons and they're made up of quarks. So they're bound together. And, uh, and it's a mystery why these quarks are um, never observed freely in nature. Um, and this is the problem of quark confinement, that why are they always in this confined state? Um, and there's a lot of uh, attention in the physics literature on, on this question, but, uh, you know, current, currently it's thought that uh, the satisfactory explanation doesn't exist. I mean, even in the physics sense, so, so forget about rigorous proof, um, you know, why, why does this happen? So, so mainly the thing is, uh, you know, if you have two quarks and they're separated by some distance, uh, the, the potential energy of this pair uh, will increase with the distance. It's believed to increase linearly. So if they start out with a certain energy, they cannot separate beyond a certain point. You know, that's, that's what is believed. And then they uh, know how to use lattice gauge theories to calculate this potential energy using these Wilson loops. Um, and so that's, so I'll, I'll tell you the mathematical formulation of this uh, later on. Uh, so this is the formulation that I'll talk about. So Wilson argued that quark confinement is equivalent to showing that certain lattice gauge theory satisfies what's uh, now known as this Wilson area law. And there are a number of deep results that are known about the area law and, uh, you know, I can talk about them, but, you know, I don't have time today and to talk about uh, this. So you can see in my, in my preprint the, uh, the results that are, that are known. Um, but the main question about proving this uh, area law in the, uh, in the theories of interest, uh, it remains open, okay? So, uh, any questions or, I, somehow I can't see the Zoom and the, 
PDF simultaneously. So I don't know if there are questions in the chat. I hope Sky has been answering. Uh, okay, so. Um, Okay, so there are these two questions. Until now, you know, I haven't said anything mathematical. You know, I'm just giving this broad uh, overview. So, uh, just you know, before saying anything mathematical, just let me tell you the um, the main result in uh, in plain language uh, is that the main result is that if the gauge group is compact, connected, and has a non-trivial center, and most of the groups of interest satisfy this condition, so SU three is the most important uh, group somehow. So SU3 is compact connected and has a non-trivial center. Uh, then if the theory has exponential decay of correlations under arbitrary boundary conditions, uh, then Wilson's area law holds. So that's the main result, okay? So, so usually, you know, um, exponential decay of correlations is thought to be the same as mass gap, but there is some little subtlety here, which I'll talk about. Uh, the non-triviality of the center is known as center symmetry. And there's a long history in physics uh, connecting center symmetry to uh, confinement. Uh, and this is, uh, I think, the first result that gives a rigorous uh, uh, justification for that. Um, now, the exponential decay uh, uh, assumption is uh, stronger than usual mass gap, which means exponential decay under specific boundary conditions. So I call it in the paper, I call it strong mass gap. Um, and there's a long-standing belief in physics uh, originating uh, in this work of Tooft uh, that mass gap, if a theory is mass gap and the center symmetry is unbroken, then, there, then you have confinement. And so this unbroken, you know, is, is not a rigorously defined concept and I don't have the time to go into that, what it means because it doesn't have a simple description. Uh, what is meant by, so center symmetry, it seems like it's just a property of the group, you know, how can it be broken? But what this means is that the effect of the center symmetry is broken somehow. Um, and uh, so, so this is, you know, there are various different definitions and none of them is completely mathematically precise uh, what is meant by unbroken center symmetry. But anyway, there is a general belief that mass gap plus unbroken center symmetry implies confinement. Now, what this result shows is that if you have strong mass gap, if you have exponential decay under all boundary conditions and you have center symmetry, so you don't have to worry about broken, unbroken, you just have uh, you know, this uh, non-trivial center, the group has a non-trivial center, then you have confinement. So now uh, what is going on here? So there was some puzzlement. I was uh, you know, talking to some faces, uh, you know, Steve Schenker and Ed Witten and uh, uh, you know, because they know that there are some theories which have both mass gap and center symmetry and, and the non-trivial center, and but they are not con known to be non -con not confining. Uh, so then it uh, so 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 then you know it took a while to understand that uh, uh, you know mass gap is actually uh, exponentially under a specific boundary condition, which is implicit, but it's you know it's not you know spelled out clearly in this way. Um, so, so this, uh, this exponential decay of assum assumption that I make is that you know, arbitrary boundary conditions is stronger. And what uh, Witten thinks uh, is that um, this, this strengthening is what prevents the spontaneous breaking of center symmetry. So I have no way to state that precisely uh, in a mathematical way what that means, uh, even after, you know, so I'll give, I'll, you know, I'll make this main result completely clear. So I'll, I'll say it, you know, I'll give out all the mathematical details of it. But even after that, I don't have a way to make this precise, but uh, anyway, so this is, the, this is what is thought to be going on physically. Um, okay. Okay, so any questions? So, um, okay, so here is, uh, so let me now go into the math, okay? So, so this is a math talk, it's not a physics talk, so I'll just go into the math now. Uh, so let n and d be two integers, n is at least one, d is at least two, and then take a, a closed connected subgroup of the interior group un, so let g be a closed connected subgroup of the interior group un, and this g will be fixed throughout, and little n will also be fixed throughout. So, uh, so think of g as SU3, okay? n is n equals three, g as su3. 
Um, now you take a big cube in uh, the lattice. So this, this is capital N. So this will be sent to infinity. Capital N will be sent to infinity. Uh, you take a big cube in the, uh, in, in the d-dimensional lattice. And then you let En be the set of positively oriented nearest neighbor edges of Bn. Okay? So each edge of this cube uh, can be positively or negatively oriented. So you just take the positive orientation. And let omega n be the set of all functions from En to, into G, which means that on each edge you have a group element. Okay, so you're attaching a group element to each edge. Okay, so, so unfortunately, you know, I have to use this notation to state the result and everything. And uh, you know, I don't like things to be notationally heavy, but you know, I couldn't avoid a little bit of uh, notation. Okay, so, uh, so let omega n be the set of all functions. Um, if you take uh, one little omega, uh, so omega subscript E means the matrix attached to the edge E. So if you take a negatively oriented edge, we define the matrix attached to that edge to be just the inverse of the matrix attached to the positively oriented version of the, of the edge. So, so we, we just have matrices attached to all positively oriented edges and they define uh, the matrix on the negatively oriented edges also. Okay. So this is the notation that we start with. So now there's this concept of a plaquette, which is very important in lattice gauge theories. Uh, so a plaquette is just a set of four directed edges that form the boundary of a square. And let Pn be the set of all plaquettes in Bn. So Bn is this big cube, and Pn is a set of all plaquettes, so little squares in Bn. And given some plaquette P and some configuration omega, define the matrix attached to the plaquette as follows. So you write P as a sequence of four directed edges, E1, E2, E3, and E4, as in this picture. Okay. And you let omega P be the multiplication of these things. So, so in, the, in the correct directions. So E3 is negatively oriented here, E1 is positively oriented. So, so you, you know, use the definition from the previous slide to define omega E3. And so there are some ambiguities in this definition about the choice of E1, which is the first edge and also the direction of traversing. So it, you, can, you can traverse in two ways, but that's not problematic because we'll only use this quantity, the real part of the trace of this matrix. And these are not affected by this ambiguity. So, so you can stop worrying about that. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, so you have this uh, picture where you have this big cube and you have um, matrices attached to edges of the cube and then you have these little plaquettes and uh, you um, attach matrices to plaquettes by multiplying the matrices along the four uh, edges forming the boundary of the plaquette. Now let del En be the set of positively oriented boundary edges of the cube and del omega n be the set of all functions from del e n into g. So these are the, this is the elements of the del omega n at the boundary condition. So these are, uh, you know, assignments of um, matrices to boundary edges. And then you can consider also the interior edges. So inside the cube, and then you, uh, uh, then you have the set of interior edges and let omega n circle be the set of all functions. So, you know, it's just very simple. <laughs> Sorry, I have to introduce this, this, this much notation. Um, so you have assignment of uh, matrices to boundary edges and to interior edges. And then yeah, you define Hamiltonian as follows. So take, fix any boundary condition delta. So you fix the, uh, the matrices on the boundary edges. And now you take any configuration inside and then you extend it to and uh, a full configuration by just defining it to be delta on the boundary. And then you define this Hamiltonian uh, as follows. The Hamiltonian is uh, you take all plaquettes, you take the real part of the trace of omega p, omega tilde, so with this extension, which means that you consider plaquettes which may contain some boundary edges also. So the boundary edges are now fixed. The interior edges are the only free things. And then you sum over all plaquettes, and that's, that's the Hamiltonian. Okay, so I'm trying to define a statistical physics model, and I think most of the people in the audience are familiar with uh, with the statistical physics, you know, Hamiltonians and so on. So, so I'm not going into the details of how why you're doing this, but 
Um, but this is the Hamiltonian for lat pure lattice gauge theory. Okay. And then you define, uh, so this, this should be H and delta. So the pure lattice gauge theory on this big cube with gauge group G coupling parameter beta and boundary condition delta is the probability measure on the space of configurations, which puts mass proportional to e to the beta h. So, you know, physicists would put a minus, you know, minus beta h and so on. So, uh, so h would also have a minus, there'll be two minuses canceling, but you know, I didn't, didn't put that in. Um, so, so this is the, this is lattice gauge theory, uh, how you define with the boundary condition. And this d lambda is uh, this product R measure. So you put a density with respect to the product R measure on the space of configurations. Okay. Okay, so, so just to have a look at the Hamiltonian again, uh, it's the sum of the real part of the trace of all the omega p's. So, so what this is doing, so you, the natural question is what happens if beta is large so in the low temperature limit of this statistical physics model, what happens is that it tries to make this as big as possible, the real part of the trace of omega p. So it tries to make all the omega p is close to identity. So these, these are unitary matrices. So this G is a subgroup of the unitary group, but these are all unitary matrices and the real part of the trace is maximized when it's the identity. So it tries to make all the omega p is uh, close to identity. Okay, so that's, that's what it tries to make. And there is no good way of visualizing that, what is exactly going on. And beta is one over G zero square, where G zero is the coupling strength. So strong coupling means that beta is small and weak coupling means beta is large. So weak coupling corresponds to low temperature and strong coupling corresponds to high temperature. And then if you have measurable function on the space of configurations, it's expectation with respect to the lattice gauge theory is just the integral with respect to this property measure. So that's lattice gauge theory with a boundary condition. Okay, so now I've defined lattice gauge theory. I have to now define the area law. Uh, so let pi be a finite dimension unitary representation of the group G and let chi sub pi be the character of pi. So you need to fix a unitary representation. Uh, so it can be G itself, you know, G going to G, but it can be some other representation. Um, and if you take a, you take a closed loop in BN, we directed the edges E1, E2, EK. And given a configuration, you define the Wilson loop variable WL omega with respect to this representation pi as, the, as follows. We multiply the group elements along the loop, and then you apply the character to that, the character of this product, uh, and that's the Wilson loop variable. So it's just a trace of uh, you know, pi omega E1 times pi omega E2 up to pi omega e, EK. And lattice gauge theory is satis uh, said to satisfy Wilson's area law for this representation, pi, if uh, the expected value of this Wilson loop variable is bounded by C1 times E to the minus C2 times the area of L for any rectangular loop L. So, you know, it's just a rectangle. Rectangular loop, loop means just a rectangle. Uh, if you take any rectangle, and area L is the area enclosed by the rectangle. So you can, of course, generalize that. You take any loop, but then you have to say what is the area enclosed by. So it can be the minimal surface area or whatever. Um, but in, in, for a rectangle, it's unambiguous what is meant by the area enclosed by this a rectangular loop. And the C1 and C2 just depend on G, beta, D, and pi. So the group, the coupling strength, the dimension uh, of the of the lattice and uh, the representation pi, and they don't depend on n. So that's critical and they don't depend on the loop L, okay? So you can, in particular, you can take n to infinity and take an infinite volume limit, and this will continue to hold for any loop, okay? So that's Wilson's area law, okay? So, so, the, so the surprising thing here yeah. is that, suppose you have exponential degree of correlations. So then you would, you know, presumably, so you have chi of pi, which is a trace of, uh, you know, pi of this thing, which means uh, pi is a representation, so it becomes pi omega E1 times pi omega E2 and so on. So you might expect that this would decay like uh, the length of the loop, okay? Now, where does the area of the loop come from? And that's the main, uh, you know, vexing question that, 
you know, uh, in fact, it's not very hard to prove that uh, this is bounded by C1 times E2, E to the minus C2 times the perimeter of the loop, of the length of the loop. Uh, in fact, for even for complicated loops, you can easily prove that it's not very hard. Um, so the question is, you know, why the area? Okay. And, and again, I don't have time to go into, uh, to explain, you know, why this implies confinement of quarks or where it comes from. So there, there is some discussion in the paper. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so here are the two main assumptions. The first is center symmetry. So we assume that the center of G is non-trivial. And moreover, um, the representation pi uh, also maps the center to a non-trivial uh, subgroup. Uh, so pi of G zero is C times the identity for some C not equal to one, where I is the n by m identity matrix n being the dimension of pi. And if pi is an irreducible representation, usually we work with irreducible, irreducible representations, you know, by Schultz lemma, this um, just means that uh, the image of the center under pi is non-trivial. Okay, so that's, that's what it means. So that's the assumption about pi and g. Okay, the strong mass gap is a little, um, it takes a little bit more to say. So let's say that two edges are neighbors if they belong to some common plaquette. And you say that a measurable map uh, on the space of configurations is a local function supported on an edge, E, if f omega depends only on the, on the matrices omega u where for u that are neighbors of this edge e. Okay, so that's, let's just define a function that just depends on a few edges that are neighbors of, of a given edge. And given two local functions like the distance fg denote the Euclidean distance between the midpoints of the supporting edges. So, you know, just for definiteness, you know, I just define it to be the distance between the supports. And here is the assumption that there are positive constants K1 and K2 depending only on G, beta, and D, and not on N or the boundary condition such that for any two local functions on the space of configurations, the correlation between them or the covariance under the lattice gauge theory is bounded by K1 times E to the minus K2 times the distance between their supporting edges. Okay, so the correlations between local functions decay exponentially. So that's the strong mass gap assumption. And the usual mass gap would be that you wouldn't have that under all boundary conditions. You would have that under some specific boundary condition. So these are the two assumptions that I make. And so here is the theorem, the full statement of the theorem. Uh, let me read it out for you. So let G be a compact connected subgroup of UN for some N. Uh, and let pi be a finite dimensional neutral representation of G. Take any D bigger than or equal to two and beta in R. So I don't even need beta to be non-negative in which can be a real number. And consider lattice gauge theory on the cube uh, BN with these parameters. And suppose that the center symmetry and the strong mass gap assumptions are satisfied. But then there are positive constants C1 and C2 depending only on G, beta, pi, and D, and not on N or the boundary condition. So, so then you take any N and any boundary condition and you take a loop that is contained, well contained in the, in BN, so it's far away from the boundary. It's contained in BN prime for some N prime less than N over two. So it's away from the boundary. Then this uh, expected value of the Wilson loop variable is bounded by C1 times E to the minus C2 times the area of L. And moreover, um, if you don't like working with this uh, in this finite boxes, one can say under these, these assumptions, under the strong mass gap assumption, that there is a unique infinite volume Gibbs state, and uh, the above bound holds for any rectangular loop L if this expectation on this side is taken with respect to this Gibbs state. So you can work in infinite volume limit. So it just works for any rectangular loop. Okay. So so uh, 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 an implication of the strong mass gap assumption is that uh, is that there is an infinite volume unique infinite volume Gibbs state, okay. and. Uh, you know, it's not clear whether you can replace the strong mass gap assumption by the unique infinite volume gap state. So let's say you assume there is a unique infinite volume gap state. Okay. 
Okay, so that's the, that's the main result. And that's just an elaboration of what I wrote down earlier. Okay, some remarks. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, the strong mass cap is stronger than usual mass cap. Um, and the strong mass cap is satisfied if beta is small enough. For any lattice gauge theory, you can show that if beta is small enough, this is, this is satisfied. And so this um, recovers an old result of Osterwalder and Zeiler, who proved that if beta is small enough, then uh, you have area law. But this says much more since we don't have, so it's essentially extended this result of Osterwalder and uh, Zeiler to say that area law holds in the full high temperature regime. So if you take the strong mass gap as a definition of the full high temperature regime, now it is believed that for usual mass gap, um, for four dimensional non-abelian theories, in particular, not all non-abelian theories, in particular for SU3 theory, which is quantum chromodynamics, that's the most important theory. Uh, for four dimensional theories, um, this exponential decay holds at all beta. And if that conjecture is correct, and you know, I've also heard it said that, uh, you know, people believe that for, for SU3, you know, uh, unique Gibbs state also holds for all beta, uh, then it's plausible that, uh, you know, the, this exponential decay under arbitrary boundary conditions also hold for all beta, okay? And so this, if, this, if we can prove that, then that will solve the confinement problem. The, you know, the, the theorem that I presented will then imply, imply confinement if, if this holds. So, uh, so one other remark is that this, there's a first rigorous result that throws light on the rules of this mass cap and center symmetry and confinement. So these are this is thing that they understand this well, the uh, roles of uh, mass gap and center symmetry. Um, and so this, um, so this is the first result that proves that. Okay, so I'll, yeah, I have a little bit of time to go into the proof sketch, um, but I don't take enough time, but I'll try. Any questions before that? Okay, so, Okay, so, so yeah, you'll see that it's not, the, the idea is actually quite simple. Um, so, so let the first coordinate in uh, RD denote time and let L be a rectangular loop with side lengths R and T where the sides of length T are parallel to the time axis so that you can imagine them going up vertically. We want to show that the expectation of the Wilson loop is bounded by C1 times E to the minus C2 times R times T. Okay, so that's what we want to show. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not very difficult to prove the perimeter law bound, which is instead of R times T of R plus T. Now, once we prove this, one can reduce this problem to this weaker bound. It suffices to prove that it's bounded by C1 times E to the, e to the plus C2 times R plus T minus C3 times R times T, okay? So it's okay to have this extra, uh, you know, nuisance term R plus T hanging out here. So that's, uh, that, is, that is all right. So then what you do is you take this loop L and you take each edge in L and you consider these matrices pi of omega E, the so pi remember is the representation of G. So you take pi omega E and you take one element from each matrix, just choose one element from each matrix and take the product. This is just, that's just a complex number. So F is a product of these elements so such a variable will call be a component variable of L. So let's call such a variable component variable and note that the Wilson loop variable is a sum of component variables because it's the trace of the product of these matrices. So of course it's a sum of products like these, okay? So it suffices to prove that for any component variable you have this bound. Once you have it, you can sum it over all component variables and you get the required bound for the Wilson loop expectation. So that's the first reduction. Now what you do is you, sp you partition space time into slabs of thickness L in the time direction. Okay, so you, uh, you take time zero, time L, time two L and so on. And you partition space time into uh, slabs like this. And let R be T over L, so the number of slabs. So if you go up to time T, so this thick uh, uh, you know, box here is the Wilson loop, uh, it is, is the loop that we are considering and you partition time into blocks of uh, length L. 
And then you take a component variable, which is just a product, you know, one element from each matrix and you take the product of those things. And then it can be decomposed into, um, into a bunch of terms, a product of some terms where U comes, U and V come from the top and bottom parts. And this F1 through FR, here R is taken to be four, but you know, R is arbitrary. So uh, F1 through FR are from the right side, G1 through GR are from the left side. And so you can write a component variable as a product like this. Right. So now what you do is, so you have to uh, show that the expectation of this product is bounded by uh, this thing, okay? Uh, so now you take a random configuration from the lattice gauge theory and consider mu prime to, the condition, to be the conditional probability distribution given all the omega e's on the boundaries between the slabs, okay? So you condition on the, on the boundaries between the slabs <clears throat> let um, angle bracket F prime denote the expected value under mu prime so that the overall expectation is the expectation of this conditional expectation. So it suffices to prove the area law for this conditional expectation with constants that are not random. Okay. So that's, that, that would be sufficient. So, um, so under mu prime, by the nature of the lattice gauge theory, you know how the lattice, lattice gauge theory is a uh, you know, mark of random field. So what, when you condition on the, um, on the boundaries between the slabs, what happens inside the slabs are independent, okay? So, so we get, and U and V are then become constant because they come from the bottom and the top and which are fixed now. So this conditional expectation can be written as a product of conditional expectations essentially. So, you know, F1, G1 prime, F2, G2 prime, F1, G R prime. So again, going back to the picture, you have this picture, so you, you, take, you have to take the product of all these variables along the loop. Now, once you condition on boundaries, um, the, what happens between, between this, within each slab become independent of each other. So F1, G1, F1 and G1 are not independent, but the product F1, G1 is independent of the product F2, G2 and so on. So this conditional expectation becomes a product of these conditional expectations. So if we want to show this, it suffices to prove that the conditional expectation of each fi gi prime is bounded by e to the minus r essentially. So r is the distance between the support of fi and gi, okay? And l, the thickness of the block is a constant, of a slab is constant. Okay, so, so this is, we are constantly reducing the problem to simpler and simpler problems. Now, under this conditional expectation, this is where the non-trivial center comes in. So you, you have conditioned on the uh, values uh, within the slabs, okay? So you have conditioned the values uh, uh, on, on, sorry, on the, on the boundaries of the slabs, okay? Now, even after this conditioning, uh, this fi and gi variables that you have, the conditional expectations are zero. And this holds because g has non-trivial center. This is not true if g doesn't have non-trivial center. Okay, so this is a small calculation that one can do and uh, you know, use the symmetry to prove that this holds. So therefore, we wanted to show that you know, fi gi prime, this has, is bounded by e to the minus c times r. So you can stick in this F, fi prime gi prime here. Okay. So we just need to show that within each slab, uh, correlations decay exponentially. Okay, these truncated correlations. So these, uh, these what, what probabilists will call co covariances. Covariances decay exponentially inside each slab after conditioning on the boundaries. And to, to the key idea is to show that this holds if the thickness is sufficiently large. Okay, so that's, that's the main thing, that under the strong mass gap assumption, one can show that if you take a slab with sufficiently large thickness, then you get exponential decay of correlations, okay? So this is a little bit like, you know, uh, how uh, analysis is done in percolation, you know, percolation theory uses all this slab analysis uh, uh, and you have to take sufficiently take slabs to get what you want. So this has some um, flavor of that, okay? So, uh, so I'll just, uh, since Alan said I can continue a little bit beyond six, so I'll, I'll just continue uh, for five minutes. Uh, so, so how do you prove this, that correlations decay exponentially if you have a sufficiently thick slab? So you take a slab like this, 
where uh, n, you know the thickness is 2n. So think of n as fixed as n going to infinity. Uh, so the set of all boundary edges that belong do not belong to either the top face or the bottom face will be called a special boundary. So the narrow faces around the slab. And consider lattice gauge theory on the slab with some given boundary condition. Um, so we'll show that uh, the influence of the special boundary near the center of S is exponentially small in this M. And this will suffice to prove what we want to prove. So this suffices to prove exponential of correlations in a sufficiently thick slab. So we'll prove this if N is sufficiently large. Okay. So then how do you prove that? So what you do is you take two boundary conditions on S that differ only on the special boundary and let mu and mu prime with the lattice gauge theories. Then you, the, the idea is to do a coupling. Uh, and if one can do a coupling so that near the center of S, the chance of the configuration differing near at, at some edge near the center, if you can show it's exponential decaying in M, then you're done. Okay. So we construct this coupling. So how this coupling is done is the following. So you first we construct a coupling in the cube. This uses the strong mass gap assumption. Okay, instead of a slab, we're doing the in a large enough cube. Um, and uh, and here we use the connectedness of the gauge group, and we we want to pass smoothly from one boundary condition to another by you know uh, doing a path in the Lee in the product Lee group. And so this is where uh, we use the connectedness, and this is why the two point correlations suffice. So somehow the, the two point correlations come in the calculations. Uh, the connectedness and also the compactness of the group. Yeah, I mean, the compactness guarantees that uh, this is also a Lie group, which is very important. Um, now, so, so then step two is that given a coupling or in a slab, now instead of a cube, we do a slab. What we do is you update the coupling. What we do is we, we choose a cube inside the slab uniformly at random, and then use the coupling from the first step to regenerate inside the cube. So you take the original coupling and then you improve it by doing something better inside this cube using the first step. And then uh, you can quantify the amount of improvement through an inequality. And this updating is repeated an infinite, infinite number of times. So we choose a cube inside the slab, we update, we choose another cube, we update. So you start from some any, any coupling initially, and then you keep updating infinitely many times. And then one can show that using a, through a subsequential limit we can get a very good coupling. And, um, and if the slab is thick enough, then a certain parameter in this inequality that we had will be strictly less than one, which will allow us to show that in the limit, the coupling that we get in the limit uh, has uh, exponential decay. Okay, so that's the sketch of the proof. And there is a preprint um, if you want to have a look. Okay, so, so that's all, thank you. <laughs>